Your colleague seems to have formed some theory, ventured Mr. Carfax, as the other left the temporary building. Colonel Fairbody shrugged his shoulders. Pry is a strange fellow, he said. There are few men whose theories I respect more, and I am quite sure that he has a reason for what he is doing. Certainly, responded Mr. Carfax, with vague politeness. Care for a light read, dear viewers? Well, tonight, Robert Gibson, XJ, and I, Nikita Zuev, are looking at another work by Francis Durham uh, Grierson, The Iron Room, published in the very next magazine of the Weird Tales, straight after the October issue of 1923. The Blink and You Will Miss It mystery also allow, uh, follows uh, Detective Paul Pry in his escapades. Contrary to the first outing on our podcast for the author, the Iron Room has a conventional story structure, starting with the detective Paul Pry and his close friend Colonel Fairbody beginning their investigation of a mysterious incident at the Carfax Chemical Company. Intrigue, guile, and love are intertwined into one, as Detective Pry does his best to untangle the puzzling nature of the Iron Room. Now, we, as I've said before, had uh, Grierson uh, and the case of the Golden Lily uh, on our podcast, and that was rather random uh, at that time. I used the generator uh, that I created in Excel sheet to get that story for that issue, um, instead of selecting one myself. But this time, uh, I did exactly that. I saw that Grierson was published, and that he had uh, another work for us to look at. And I was just wondering, who, who is this Grierson guy, right? What, what can he do for us? Can, can he surpass the thing that he has created? And as we saw, he can. Uh, I hope uh, my, um, my co-hosts uh, will agree. Because the Iron Room, regardless whether you think of the quality of it, uh, of it being fantastic or not, it is definitely better than the Golden Lily. Way better. And so I started to look into the uh, man, Francis D. Grierson, who was born in 1888. What a year, right? Uh, in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and uh, he uh, wrote a lot of detective stories. And when I'm talking about a lot... I literally mean he had several series, uh, series that followed different type of uh, detectives. So there was the George R. Moore novels, and that has um, almost 10, if not 10. There's the Andrew Ash, uh, which features way more um, novels, about 14, 15. And uh, it, al it also has um, cross-references with the George Moore series. They sort of work together on cases in some, uh, in some areas. Um, one of his more earlier works was the Inspector Sims and Professor Wells novels, um, which uh, the earliest one was written in 1924, a year after The Iron Room. And... Uh, there were various other novels uh, that weren't part of his series, like The Lady of Despair, Mystery in Red, The Empty House, The, the Heart in the Box, and so on and so forth. And although um, Francis uh, Grierson does not seem to me the type of author that many people remember, uh, he did create a lot of work, and he was very passionate about mystery. Um, in fact, um, when, I, when I started looking up some of his novels, I um, ventured forth and started reading one of them. Uh, I think the, the one that I started to read was called The Limping Man. And uh, to my surprise, the, uh, well, perhaps not surprise, but to my um, mm, enjoyment, the, the work was uh, rather entertaining. And so, to me, it clearly seems that um, 
after moving on from writing short stories, uh, Mr. Grierson had a pretty good career back home in London, um, where he died. Uh, uh, he died in 1972. And um, I, I got to thinking about um, detective stories in, uh, in general, and I um, sort of recognized without ever really placing it in my head before that, I mean, the most famous of all detective stories come from England, right? Sherlock Holmes. Um, so I wonder what made this, uh, this individual write all these uh, stories. Were, were they influenced uh, by Sherlock Holmes? Um, but that's enough about the offer for now. Um, as far as the, the Iron Room itself is concerned, I think uh, it would be rather interesting to see what my co-hosts think about the story. So why don't I pass it on to Robert? What do you think about mm. the Iron Room? Right. Well, uh, I, first of all, I'd just like to say that I quite like his style. Uh, he's kind of very... Um, well, let me read a sentence. The amateur had acquired the confidence of the professional, however, by the services he had rendered to the yard on several occasions, and the colonel had a sincere respect for the reasoning powers which had led Paul to the solution of certain singular problems in which they had both been engaged. Now, um, it's quite a relief sometimes to read that sort of I wouldn't call it a convoluted sentence. It's, it's simply a straightforwardly competent, long English sentence, which sometimes you get to feel that it, it's become an endangered species. Uh, so I like that. I like the fact that it happens in Hertfordshire, which is the county in which I lived for 27 years. Um, I like the fact that the technical talk remains this side of indigestible, only just, but it does remain this side of it. Um, but even if there had been some indigestible technical stuff, I could have just beaten it by skimming. I'm, I'm getting quite good at that. But I didn't have to on this occasion. And the plot, which deals with a disappearance it's always a good idea for someone who wants to create a mystery and the solution i don't have to give it away exactly by saying that it the murder plan relies on somebody standing in a certain position when he's performing an action and you can say this is rather over elaborate raymond chandler commented on Dorothy Sayers last final Peter Whimsey mystery Busman's Honeymoon saying that any murderer relying on that much luck should realize he's in the wrong business and try his hand at something else uh, mm. but nevertheless um I being a tolerant chap believe in in the plot when I'm reading about it because I I like to cooperate with the author. If he's good enough to use his skills to write an entertaining story, then I'm like somebody at a pantomime who joins in with the, oh, yes, he is, oh, no, he isn't, he's right behind you, that kind of sentiment. Uh, so, um, so there we are. I, For all those reasons, I like the story. And I was... I suppose I expected it to be to have a technical solution, and it does. There are clues scattered through the story to justify that solution retrospectively. Uh, so yeah, I give it the, the thumbs up. Yeah, I actually I like the fact that there's um, there's this whole thing about. Um, Having the clues right in front of the reader, and although you're shown them, you can't really put them together until the detective does. I think that's done really well in the Iron Room. Um, mm. And, you know, you, you sort of get this feeling of like, okay, but why are we being shown this? What is the reason behind seeing um, <clears throat> this information or this object? And then when it becomes clear, it's very satisfying to sort of have this aha 
interesting. Um, mm. This is how this whole thing went down, and these uh, objects was, were used thusly. Yeah, uh, what about you, actually? What did you think about the Iron Room? Uh, first of all, it I agree with both of you. It is a definite step up from uh, the Golden Lily. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just in terms of the scope of the story itself, but also with how with how much more elaborate the setup is, which is actually very important for a um, detective story because I, th I always feel that one of the most important things about writing a proper detective story is that the clues that are available to the um, character within the story should be made available to the reader as well to give him a chance to piece things together, so to speak, and to pit wits with uh, the author. So there's a bit of a chess match and challenge uh, between the reader and the author. And Sherlock Holmes is, of course, an exemplar of uh, that sort of uh, writing. And the story itself is not bad. It's uh, it's fairly light reading. It's um, and quite entertaining. Uh, it's it's not quite a, a Sir Otto Conan Doyle or a Agatha Christie, but um, for somebody who might be absolutely ravenous for that kind of a. Uh, story it would be a nice appetizer in between um the the beginning of the story uh starts out fairly uh well structured you have you have colonel fairbody coming in and then uh talking to popry uh which starts the action right away which is which is i feel like a uh, really great way to for a short story to start off is you don't waste too much time um, meandering about uh, and then you have the very uh, you have the discussion and the interview in the in the room with uh, f um, Mr. Carfax and that is also a great way for a short story to set up the uh, physical evidence um, of the story the low point of the story for me is when Miss Carfax came in and um, Paul Pry was uh, asking some questions and he immediately jumped to uh, shall we say a hypothesis that um, that uh, Miss Carfax, oh no, the one one of the uh, one of the uh, person involved, the person who was killed, might have had something for, might have felt something for Miss Carfax, uh, and that to me. So there are two things wrong with that, uh, with that particular setup. One. Uh, Where is the setup for that? Like, like, uh, Fran Francis Durham Greer Grierson, yeah, he went through all the trouble to set up the physical state of the, the the case, but then the relation no sh the relational web of the case was completely absent up until that point, and then suddenly he made the Paul Prime made that uh logical leap to come to this uh, guess very accurate one that uh, there might have been something going on between uh, Miss Carfax and uh, the dead person and that's like how do I say this uh, Nikki would be familiar with this because you you play tabletop game right you have two two kinds of knowledge you have the you have the player knowledge and then you have the character knowledge 
right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So a, a player who, who plays the tabletop game, he will most likely have read all the uh, rules of the tabletop and blah, 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 and he could piece things together. But that, if you, if you, if you then take that knowledge and then presumes the character has that knowledge, uh, it makes for broken gameplay. And the conversely, that's like uh, you, your character would also know things about the world that he is in, that only the only the character would know, the player wouldn't. That's why you mm. have all those checks and rolls and stuff like that. So, so here's 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 the thing. The the ju- the leap in conclusion for that particular scene was all character knowledge. The, the reader was given none of that. So, so that was a very, very poor setup. It is a poor setup because it now then, uh, first of all, obviously the, the reader isn't in on it. He has no way to connect the dots and it's a bit of a deuac machina. Um, second of all, it completely narrows the possible outcome of the mystery and makes the ending fairly predictable. Like who is the actual murderer? Because at this point you just, you just brought it down to a couple of names. If you read the story. So that is the low point of the, of, of the short story for me. And, and I also have to say, um, the the is it it's 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 interesting that uh mr grayson took this particular uh direction as well because i i see that as more of a agatha christie kind of a uh style of writing where she she is more she is more um psychological like uh, her detective novels are less based on physical uh, setup like Sherlock Holmes is uh, her novels are more like the mind webs you know like the relations relational and the emotional web that connect all her cast of characters and she does that really well her setup is as elaborate as any Sherlock Holmes stories uh, but it's completely absent here and as for the final scene, uh, without giving anything away, I would say that that particular um, method of crime, <laughs> shall uh-huh. we say, is, uh, I mean, it was the same thing in, 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 uh, in The Golden Lily. He used the same thing. It's, it's uh, the mysterious force known as electricity. I'm like... I think I think at this point, uh, let me just step in. If yeah. you if you want to read this, uh, go read it because I think it will be pretty <laughs> difficult for actually to explain what why he he doesn't like this. But also let me add that I I agree with with a lot of the points XJ made, and I want to go a little bit deeper in them. But yeah, spoiler mm. warning: we're gonna spoil the ending of the the Iron Room. Please, please go on, XJ. Thank you for that. I was like wondering how to uh, continue. But yeah, it's like. Uh, yeah, it falls back to the mysterious force known as electricity, and then the mastermind is some kind of uh, adeptus elevatum of the il- art of electrical engineering, with uh, with uh, because of his knowledge of how to make circuits and stuff like that, he could el- make an elaborate uh, mouse trap trap door really that activates uh, <laughs> where the certain piece of music is played. Uh, while admiring a, a vase, which is what uh, Robert was talking about. If you need something that, with that many moving parts, uh, yeah. The the mastermind should consider a different line of work. <laughs> yeah, so there is this, there's this vase, basically. And it vibrates on a certain frequency. Because it vibrates on a certain frequency, he has chosen a specific song... So that when this frequency plays, the mechanism activates 
and a giant trap, uh, you know, trap door uh, opens up uh, in the middle of the room where a person would be sitting, and they are supposedly, you know, become victim of this uh, contraption and die. <laughs> Right. Basically, Which, I mean, uh, a tumble yes. into some uh, ruins uh, found beneath the newly built building. All of that, all of that prior setup is actually pretty good. Uh, I like that it tied back in uh, towards the end. Uh, Correct. The, yes. The stuff is not wasted, but the the <laughs> yeah, it's very convoluted. Yeah. I I I think there was a desire. Uh, to 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 do something because this is not only is this a short story this is a short story in a magazine filled with like 20 other tales so i think at a certain point uh somebody who who's an author uh they're trying to either um impress the readership so that people are like oh yeah that's a really good story i'm gonna write a letter about that one because that was a crazy con conclusion i could have never come up with that or which is probably more likely, they're trying to impress the editor, right? Competing for the spot. And so, well, my story is crazy. It's got this, uh, you know, the use of the new how electricity and there's a chemical, um, you know, um, company involved and the, the military is involved and the Scotland Yard and blah, blah, blah. Right, and you're like, oh my God, and that's only five pages? And you're like, yeah, right. So, so that might be it um, as to why this... Uh, this method is used, but you know I don't know really. Um, mm. I am gonna read uh, some of the novels of um, Mr. Grierson because I am I'm fascinated by by his style, uh, and I want to see how how it has evolved because 1923 is basically the beginning of this uh, gentleman's career, <laughs> right? 1924 is one of his first novels, if not the first novel. Which is very interesting because uh, that would be seven years before. Uh, the death of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Mm. Arthur Conan Doyle died in uh, 1930, and it has been, it had been known for quite some time before that that he hated Sherlock Holmes. He wanted to get away from the guy as much as he could. So I yeah, wonder. Yeah, he, he he. I mean, you you know, he tried to kill him. He killed Sherlock Holmes in the story, and then the readership was like. We don't care about anything else you write. Just give us Sherlock Holmes. And then he had to resurrect him. Mm. He made him very unlikable in that story too. I remember quite fondly how, how he just, he gets, he becomes like a complete addict to, um, uh, God. The white powder. The, uh, po the poppy seed stuff. What, what's it called? Cocaine. Oh, sorry. Cocaine. Cocaine. Oh, was it cocaine? Okay. Yeah. Well, never mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He gets addicted. And he's having loads of trouble. And um, basically, Watson can't get, a, can't get a grip on this dude. He just keeps disappearing. And then he just dies fighting uh, Moriarty. They fall off uh, uh, the uh, waterfall. But, okay, I don't know uh, I th whether or not Arthur Conan Doyle really hated Sherlock Holmes that much. Because if I hated a character... I would make a very definitive death. I would not be like, and they fell off the waterfall and nobody found them. Okay? That's just asking for it to come back, right? No, so so there is a there is a YouTube channel called Tales Foundry, which did a did a segment on uh, Sherlock Holmes that oh, yeah? I watched. Yeah. Please and, enlighten me. Yeah, so uh Doyle had no choice but to bring Sherlock Holmes back because the public pressure on him was immense according to tales foundry anyway there there were people who walked up to him in the streets <laughs> called him a murderer <laughs> it was pretty bad uh uh from from uh what i heard so with that kind of public pressure i think uh mr doyle had no choice but to bring mr holmes back but that's not what I'm uh, talking about. I'm talking about more the fact that if I wanted uh, a character to be definitively dead, I'd make a much more elaborative, and then he, his head gets cut off and everybody sees I mean, it. it's, like... it, what I'm trying to say is perhaps in, uh, in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's mind, that was a very definitive death. Maybe not so gruesome as 
having him guillotined, but to him it could have been, and then he had to bow to public pressure. But even if you had his head cut off, you could have the next story saying, um, you know, it was. It turned out to be just a dream that his head was cut off, uh, or or some kind of a door, you know, elaborately made door. Both of you, both of you are quite correct. But what I'm talking about is the ending. Literally says that no one found the body, right? It's kind of. Mm. It's like you're asking to come back. Is what I'm. So talking about. So what you're about. saying is perhaps deep down he wasn't really sure he wanted to kill him. Yeah, um, that's right. That's right. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah, perhaps. Who knows? Or but you know, all the public records say that uh, Conan Doyle deeply uh, regret having to. Perhaps it's a matter of of the fact that he much preferred to write other things, and he would have been happy to write more Sherlock Holmes. Except no one wanted to read anything by him, except Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes you yeah. have become the prisoner of your own art. Yeah, mm. uh, and we all know um, artists that are defined by that one uh, thing that they made and <laughs> nothing else. Yeah, I mean, look mm-hmm. at um, you know, certainly it's it's very different in the in the artistic uh, ways, I guess, because um, when an artist draws in a style, I don't think they could get tired of that style what are the cases like i mean look at frank frazetta right he always drew in the same style but i don't think he was like oh i hate drawing muscle bound man and you know beautiful women i want to stop uh when i say artist though what i'm i tend to just lump all the creative uh yeah 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 i I understand what you mean but i will raise you an example yeah oh okay Uh, okay. akira toriyama he he Really, he he really wanted to stop drawing Dragon Ball. <laughs> really, he didn't. Want to draw, he didn't like, want to go on mean, anymore. Like, like, like the story or the style or both. The, the style style is not something you can change on a whim. It's very hard. It's like a right. It's like writing style. So I I will I will put uh style aside. But subject matter, like um, uh, fighting comics. Uh, the mm. the kind that he used to do uh, for Dragon Ball, he definitely wanted to stop doing that. Except, are, are you from? Oh yeah, sorry. Go. Yeah, except that it made too much money, and uh, the 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 he he just found it impossible to stop. Uh, to actually, he did stop. Um, it was the studios that took over. I think it was Toei that. Continue. Is it Toei? No, I. That was Toei Animation. Correct. Toei Animation. Toei Animation did the animation. I don't think they continued writing the comics. The I think he wrote until Margin Bupu, and then so everything yeah, Mar- else after that was ghost written. Yes. Mm. Yes. So it. I mean, it's it's very hard to distinguish the. What, what was going on with the anime at the time and the manga at the time because the anime is what like for you to understand robert dragon ball uh is a series that is so popular that people from brazil and japan have consumed exactly the same media mm-hmm. right and they can connect with one another without understanding the language of one another one of them just could, could go uh, and say goku and the other would understand what he means and who he's talking about, right? It, it was a huge thing. It still is a huge thing. Not as big as it was in the 90s and the early 2000s. But, you know, um, you go to any s- small store or, or even a big store that sh- sells T-shirts, there's going to be a Dragon Ball Z T-shirt somewhere there. Um, you know, um, there's all, all the merch in the world could probably fill the, you know, like that, the, the gray deep depth, the thing that uh, we are trying to get down into to, um, you know, see what's, what's below the, the surface of the ocean, the deepest level of the ocean. You could probably cover all of that in that merch and it'd be still more um, for the Great Canyon. Um, so, so it You're was talking huge. about and... the Mariana Trench? Yes, that's right. Hmm. Uh, and, um, 
the story really doesn't matter. The story is like Superman, basically. It's a it's a rip off of Superman. Uh, kid comes back, uh, comes come you know from an alien planet comes to um, the the Earth, and uh, he he gets picked up by a nice individual who trains them uh, until that individual is killed. And uh, the protagonist Goku, he has to move on and become stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, with with the added bonus of uh, because Akira Toriyama has learned from consuming Superman that he could do Superman but better, and uh, he he made it so that uh, it was Goku's fault that his father died. So there was a huge push, you know, for him to understand that how to control himself and how to be a great fighter, and so and so so forth. And then at some point. It turns out Goku never knew that he was an alien. Nobody ever told him. And then uh, the alien people that did send him here come back. And he was like a biological weapon that was sent to conquer Earth. Uh, and now he has to deal with the galaxy. So he's like, he goes on off into space and fights people there. It goes crazy, right? Um, but... Uh, I, I digress um, on, on the summary of, of Dragon Ball. The reason I'm, I'm sort of giving you all this is um, there was a point where Akira Toriyama wanted to stop, and that was the Cell Saga. So the, at the Cell Saga, he, he sort of said to himself, okay, this is a, you know, like there's the passing of the torch. Goku has a son called Gohan. Goku's kind of out of the picture, and Gohan is the one who deals the final blow to the bad guy. There we go. Beautiful ending. He has been building up Gohan for like several arcs to show his progression, and now it's finally there. And then <laughs> the editor was like, "We gotta do. St are you looking? Look at this. Look at all this money. You know, like it's basically like raining down from the sky." And he does one more arc. And he has to, because Goku died, he has to bring Goku back somehow. And this comes back to, to uh, what's it called, Sherlock Holmes, right? All right, so, actually, Goku has been dead in the story before. And what happened was, he went to hell, and he was so strong that he basically beat the hell out of hell, and then found um, a super great... Uh, um, What's it called? Teacher called the uh, Kai, the Great Kai, who taught him um, how how to be even stronger, right? So he he's been he's been dead, and what he's been doing uh, during being dead is training. So when he comes back, he's even stronger than before. So the stakes have to be raised even higher, and it goes, you know, it once again goes crazy. The world has to be saved, and then uh, Akira Toriyama said, okay. He put his foot down. I'm done. You can animate some other stuff that you want. Uh, I'm not doing anything else. Uh, and for 12 years or so, or about maybe 14 years, that was it. He didn't get himself involved until he approved and co-wrote a script for a um, straight-to-DVD movie. Oh, well, no, actually, it was shown in theaters um, called... Um, oh, God. It involves um, a god. <laughs> this is the level. This is the level that Goku is at at this point. It involves a god of destruction who is the head of uh, the universe. And he can just destroy the universe if he wants to. And he just comes around into planets and just... He taps... This is the beginning of the movie. He taps on uh, a planet because they kind of mispleased him but kind of pleased him. And half of the planet explodes. So the other half gets to live. But, you know... He sort of, oh don't ask me how that works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, what did you say? I was saying it sounds like Warhammer. Uh... No, no, it's worse because it's, it's drawn uh, much more pleasantly. So all of, the, all of the thought process that you would have to go through in Warhammer being like, man, war is hell and it's all horrible. Here is played for a comedic effect that he destroys half the planet. Dragon mm -hmm. Ball is a comedy, kind of. Mm -hmm. Um, in a lot of ways, at least. Um, and anyway, so he does this movie. Uh, obviously, Goku doesn't beat God of Destruction, but he 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 ties with him somewhat. Um, there's there's a whole new transformation. He gets even stronger. Uh, and Akira Toriyama gets his flame back, and he starts uh, working with the team a little bit to 
to push all the stuff through. Um, uh, and then he, he gets called. Back then. <laughs> yeah, he got sucked back then. He, he, so there was a new TV show. There was like a new manga that's still going on. But now, so after a few issues, uh, Akira Toriyama stepped back and basically said, this is this new guy. I think he gets me, and he's now he's not even ghostwriting it. He's he's just writing the new the new that, manga. That is hilarious. Mm-hmm. Well, I I I kind of stopped following uh, Dragon Ball for a long time now. But uh, so thank you for all the background information. Now, no problem. To bring it back to the Iron Room. <laughs> oh yeah, we're discussing a detective story, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, I, there's one way to bring back, um, you know, Dragon Ball into the discussion with the Iron Room, or, or the other way around, should I say? Um, I think one um, solidifying thing that that XJ brought up uh, about any narrative is um, some sort of a human connection to to the individuals. And while I will commend how the story has been written. Uh, when it comes to the technical side, right, like how how the prose itself um, reads and is written, um, and also the mystery being interesting to follow, I think just like actually that the human side is lacking uh, in a lot of ways. And you know, one of the main components of that is the fact that Paul Pry just assumes that this woman had some sort of a relationship with this uh, individual. I mean, the way you could change that line like this and, and sort of have a different meaning, he could have just said, so what was your relationship with Mr. Vane? What, what kind of a relationship was between the two of you? And she could have just told him, you know, just like a human being, hey, yeah, it was kind of into me. And then you, you wouldn't need to have this thing. But I guess maybe Francis uh, uh, Gr- uh, Grierson, he wanted um, Paul Pry to come off as really intelligent, that he has already guessed that there was something between the two of them or something like that. Um, I mean, that's just me tr- trying to guess, right? Um, but even even Paul Pry himself, I don't really understand his personality. Uh, he uh, he is weird, but he is polite. He is uh, intriguing, but he's also dull. He's described in uh, various ways uh, in the in the tale, and I I can't really pin down Paul Pry in my head. And I I mean that's bad. If if I can't pinpoint the the protagonist and have an image of him or, or get his personality, I think that uh, you know the prose is failing at doing something. Wouldn't you agree, gentlemen? Not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll tell you what. This this story has made me think about um, the detective genre in a in a wider sense. Partly to do with XJ's point that um, the story doesn't give the reader the character knowledge um, to solve the mystery. But I think that actually that's that's often got to be true in a detective story. You've got to hide some of the character knowledge from the reader. Otherwise, you might as well just tell the reader straight off who did it. Um, Now, some detective stories or other crime stories make it obvious from the start who did the crime. And the object is not to find out who did it, but to try and find evidence to nail the obviously guilty person. Uh, but this isn't this isn't like that. This is actually trying to find out who was guilty. Uh, I think that um, well, it's made me think that detectives. It may be. It may be that in order to enjoy a lot of detective stories, one has to really give up on the idea that it's a sort of chess game with the reader. And instead, here's my radical reinterpretation of the genre now, instead look upon it as a a kind of branch of fantasy literature in which detectives are a special kind of breed of intuitional wizard. So they are allowed to um, know things which an ordinary person wouldn't know by methods, intuitional methods, which they may not understand themselves. And thereby you lose a lot in that you lose the 
confidence that you can um, share the clues with the detective and have a go at solving it yourself and that might mean a lot to a lot of readers but on the other hand what you don't lose is a, what to me is the big advantage of the detective story and that it simply gives some sort of excuse some sort of frame to hang a plot on which is interesting for the same reason that a histor good historical novel is interesting that is to say because detectives have to work out the details of a situation it actually tells the reader a great thing a great lot about the assumptions of the society in which it's set the nuts and bolts of life in that society for example here in the 1920s if it really is set in the same period that it was written I don't, i'm not sure about that um, but certainly with agatha, 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 agatha christie dorothy sayers arthur conan doyle and also the raymond chandler books who were a bit set a bit later uh, it's they're fascinating as historical novels to me uh, they you, you can find out how things worked i mean i dare say a lot of it uh, may be mistake, mistaken but the the authors usually seem to know what they're talking about so there we are reinterpretation detectives as intuitional wizards for i know that may be true in some cases i think some amount of uh character knowledge is um, unavoidable uh, permissible permissible <laughs> uh, uh, specifically uh, setting related uh, knowledge like the fact that there is a chemical factory in Herefordshire uh, oh. Hertfordshire uh, you know, those are things that is within the setting itself that uh, the readers would have no way of knowing, right? Um, although uh, I can imagine Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, writing something similar with uh, by starting off with a newspaper that a newspaper article that Watson might be reading. You know that has a that has a passing mention of a uh, chemical factory, and then uh, and then uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, making the connections and then explaining how he did it. You know that sort of thing. So I think some amount of um, uh, uh, character knowledge is unavoidable in a detective story, specifically dealing with uh, setting issues. I think the problem with using too much of that is in a detective story is that there it, it stops being a detective story. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. So I think it, it it's um it, it, it's not something that uh, somebody, I feel anyway, somebody writing in the detective genre uh, want to indulge in too much th that intuitional uh, let's just say rather that um, having something that is so well connected that uh, it's possible for a reader to to challenge the author on on how the things go that is a, that is a golden standard to shoot for and people might fall wherever in between or just slightly off or maybe even meet it as they write yeah mm. aspirational mm. in other words mm. yep yeah yeah the, the bulk of it has got to be uh, something more traditional I, I agree but even so some really good works classed as, as detective stories i'm thinking of nemesis by agatha christie for example largely are, are largely character studies um rather than um 
normal detective stories. But well, yeah, I correct. Mean, which, sorry, go ahead, Nikki. Co- correct, which is why I was saying that this was certainly lacking for me in this story. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted more out of Paul Pry as a character. Because uh, I don't really... I don't care who who died and who killed and who went uh, missing. What I care about is the guy who who's solving it and the people threatened by this mystery or the situation you could you could write a really compelling story where the protagonist is actually the guy who did the crime or the the person the girl who did the crime uh, mm. and you could make a very compelling why they did this why this person did this um why she or he did it and not only that but uh, make the detective the bad guy because they're chasing our hero, right? By simply using um, the the reader's uh, own de- desire to to see uh, the protagonist prevail against them and make them root for someone evil. So you, you know that has been done in many great movies like Scarface. I mean, the entire cast of Godfather. They're all horrible people. They kill one another. They they live outside the law, but you really want to see uh, this 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 house this uh, this maf- those mafiosos that have been threatened at the beginning of the movies uh, the, of the movie that we are following. You want them to succeed uh, because they have been framed as these underdogs that have been attacked, and you're like, oh man, we, something's got to do. Wait, what you really should be thinking if you, if you are a law-abiding citizen is. Some police officers should come out and arrest all of these people, all of the involved parties, right? Uh, well, it wouldn't be any good because the police officers are as crooked as as, as the mafia. In uh, that is true. In, yeah. That's for sure. But you know, you get my point, right? Yeah, you understand yeah. what I'm talking about. The power yeah. of the author is to make the reader care about mm-hmm. the protagonist. Uh, you could have. Um, fantastical world building you could have amazing set pieces you could be the best author of fight scenes but if you can't make the reader connect with the character i think you're you're just gonna you're gonna be hitting that ceiling and Mm -hmm. you're never never gonna be passing it because if you can't make the person care for the for the protagonist um i think i think you're you know like you're not going to be uh, elevating your work uh, to to the next level, and I think this is the problem with this one for me, because I don't I don't relate to any of these people. This is this is just a nice story to read, uh, but it hasn't really made me feel ever which way about anyone in it. The the one and only Agatha Christie novel I read was Murder on the Orient Express. Um... Uh, it uh, her 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 type of mystery is not really my kind of thing. So, but I have to say, she, as I mentioned before, she lays down the the connections between her characters with as much elaborate care as uh, Arthur Conan Doyle does with his physical evidence. Like, they have relationships that make sense, and you catch hints of it as the story progresses. You know, so it's not it's not something that just come came out of nowhere as abruptly as this uh, this uh, this uh, yeah. Paul Pry asking um, uh, Miss Carfax where, why whether Wayne is uh, vain rather is is mm. uh, into her. I mean, yeah, involved with her, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, something just occurred to me, and I think like the 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 best example I have uh, readily to mind to to illustrate what I mean when um when I say like the you you have to give a chance the, the reader a chance to to match wits with the author is is the is the movie Sixth Sense. Um. It's it's a brilliant movie. Uh, although I I doubt M Night Shyamalan understood what made his movie that particular movie brilliant because uh, he failed to uh, recapture the moment. So the the most powerful thing about the movie was the twist at the end where we know uh, where we find out 
Bruce Willis has actually did, right? But the thing is, throughout the whole movie, uh, the the filmmakers have been very careful to lay the grounds for 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 um, a very very astute uh, watcher of the show to intuit that perhaps Bruce Willis himself it was dead. See, um, we it's very clever on two two levels. So one is. Um, the little boy told Bruce Willis when he talked to him that I can see dead people, and that 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 plays on uh, the it, it plays on the the assumption of the 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 watcher that um, you know if if the boy is talking to Bruce Willis and he seems to be dead, you know Bruce Willis is alive and well, you know. Uh, but then throughout the movie, you realize at the end at the end when Bruce. Bruce Willis realizes he's dead. You see the sequences in which uh, the show is shot, where it it was set up to look as if Bruce Willis is actually interacting with the um, with uh, with the people in the scene, but it turns out that it's it it's not. You know, he was he was not there. Mm-hmm. The people were just doing their own thing, and then you know he was just invisible to them. And if you watch the uh, the uh, f- uh, filmmakers uh, 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 filmmakers interview what they said they said that uh, what they did was in every sequence where there is a dead person there is something red in that shot that announces that this this is this a uh, dead person is in in the shot so when I was watching the show, I completely missed that. Then I went back and watched the show just because of that, and and I I I really tried, and watched every frame. And it turns out it's true. Every scene where there was a dead person, there was something red, in the shot. So that is a that is a example of a setup that that you know, is right there in front of your eyes. If you pay attention, you can catch it. And I think that is the uh, that. A, a well written um, detective story should have should be able to have that uh, thing going. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think this it, you know there's very little, little that I could add or disagree with in what you said. Uh, I I just like to say um, one of the two examples of uh, works that we looked at and was very good at uh, connecting you with the character, uh, irregardless whether or not I feel like that that work was good. Uh, Brother was very good. Very recently we looked at it, but it was very good at connecting you with um, the the titular brother. Uh, uh, you know, you could really f- you feel his struggle and uh, the fact that he had to stay all his life... Um, in that house, you know, it, it it could, and for me, it resonated with me. And uh, actually, a story that um, that was done for by, uh, for the short story challenges by by Kaz, uh, old friends. I think that that tale made you really feel for for the two individuals that are talking to one another, with all but dialogue. And I think that is a commendable. I uh, think to do in a in a short story, um, where you are using dialogue only. Mm. Mm. There you go. Um, I I think I the Iron Room is fine. <laughs> it's a little bit more than fine, I guess. It's uh, it's a good tale that has been written well with well constructed prose. Certainly better prose that. Uh, I I could do um, at this point in uh, in in my career, right? Like this this the commanding uh, authority that uh, Grierson has over the English language is commendable, and the mystery itself is also good. It's it's fun to follow. I mean, the resolution you can take it or leave it, but. The following, which is probably the most important part of any mystery, is is fun. Um, still, there are certain aspects of it that are lacking for me. So, 
Um, do you have anything else that you would like to say, or should we move on to the scores? Uh, well, this has been a really good discussion about this wide, wide ranging discussion. Uh, so it's made me think uh, we should do some more detective stories, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it's. I I like the story, and I'm prepared to give it a a high Go score. On. A high maybe, score, I'd, okay. I'd give it maybe a seven and a half. Seven and a half. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's not it's not so far away from my score, but I would actually uh, interject and I say I don't think it's detective stories or not. I actually think it's the it's the discovery that that keeps happening with the weird tales. Um, out of the f- six now stories that we did. Uh, I think we found most of them at least fascinating. And uh, mm. I think only Osiris was really a dud. Everything else, we kind of had something to say. Uh, some <clears throat> but detective stories are also fun. So, mm. um, And I cheated, all right? I cheated uh, this time when it comes to Weird Tales. I didn't randomly generate a story for the sixth issue. So maybe I'll take a, a random one from the sixth issue uh, again next time we do Weird Tales. But um, anyway... Um, yeah, I, th- I think that you, the viewer, you've heard everything that I've had to say really about the story. I will give it a 6.5 out of 10. Um, and I would give it, a, you know what? I'd give it even a point more if I could care about Paul Pry or someone else in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can't, I don't care about them, unfortunately. Uh, actually, what about you? What is your score? I'm going to give it a 5.5. And the reason for that is, I think Paul Pry is a prototype for future works for Mr. Grierson. You can see, you can see his like, if this is his early works, you could, you, I, I imagine like further novels in uh, the future novels that he writes would have, would have more refinement. Um, you can uh, it's uh, it's uh it's part of the copying process uh, i feel it it really does give me that sense where he's trying out things his his uh his uh uh is a little bit like Cow the conqueror to conan hmm yeah so it's a diamond in the making so to speak uh but it's clearly not a diamond yet so, 5.5. Still an entertaining read. Uh, if you have nothing better to do on a Saturday morning, this is a mm. good story to pass half an hour of your time. Mm. All right. Any last words, friends? Um, if if any I, of uh, um, our viewers find... Uh, a treasure trove of where one can find uh, Grierson books. Let me know, because it has been actually pretty hard to find any of his works online. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say I'm interested to hear what uh, Nikki said about how prolific this chap was. I hadn't guessed it was anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, he, he has a lot of novels. Mm. Mm. Kind of crazy. Having and all of them are published, right? Sorry, yeah. what were you saying? No, no, no. It's that is very admirable uh on his own and a, quite an achievement. Mm. He was also apparently uh a lawyer and an engineer by <laughs> trade. <laughs> so so so, so maybe so- XJ, <laughs> maybe you're full of shit and he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, like, probably exactly. Not. So all the elaborate setup about vibrational vessels and all that stuff actually uh came from his electrical engineering background. Maybe he is Could an adapter's be. elevator of something. Maybe maybe <laughs> all of his stories is, is him failing to kill people. <laughs> and he's just, he's just adapted it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I guess we have nothing else to add. And uh, with that, we bid the audience goodbye. But uh, before we sign off completely, we are in the process of improving the podcast so if you all have any suggestions or have things that you want us to to do please feel free to put in the comments below